Hi everyone, welcome to our special uh, Facebook Live panel on renewable energy here in Hong Kong. I'm Douglas from WWF Hong Kong and uh, we're going to be hearing about uh, renewable energy's potential in Hong Kong and probably a, a little more about uh, why we're so far behind the, uh, the rest of the world in developing uh, renewables. Uh, with me to discuss is uh, Prashant Vaze, our uh, head of climate and energy practice here in WWF Hong Kong, and uh, Professor Johnny Chan, Chair Professor of Atmospheric Science at the City U. Thanks for joining us. I, I'm going to start with you, uh, Prashant. Um, give us the sort of the state of play uh, for renewables right now in Hong Kong. So at the moment here in Hong Kong, we don't really have very much renewables. Um, we, we have something like 3% of um, our kind of gas demand is met by, by biogas, and that's really provided by things like landfill sites. Um, we, we have some renewable oil, so about 4%, 0.4% rather, uh, biodiesel. And that's really made from used cooking oils and fats and things like this. Oh, OK. But the really disappointing one is, is the fact that we've got so little uh, renewable electricity, a mere 0.1% which is far, far below uh, a lot of the norms in other countries. Are we, uh, Johnny, are we behind the rest of the world? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, there are many places in the world that have a lot more renewable and, and, and it's not that we don't have the resources. It's whether we want to implement the technology and whether there is uh, policies to support the development of renewable energy in Hong Kong. Now, what, what's, give us a ballpark percentage of uh, a, a country or a city that's doing well on renewables. What percentage of their generation would, would it be? Well, I mean, Europe as a whole has set itself a target of 20% of each of those three, of uh, transport, electricity, and, um, and, and gas. And it's, it's, it's already sort of way in excess on, on the 20% by when? Um, by 2020. By 2020. So it's a quite an ambitious target, really. And even you know, a place like Taiwan, which is a bit like us, it's uh, very densely populated, very heavily populated with not much free land. And I think that's going for something like 25% uh, by 2020, so uh, by 2030 rather. So you know, other places are much more ambitious than us. So our figure is 0.1%? 0.1%, yes, less than 0.1% electricity. Okay, so there's <laughs> room for improvement. What's our target? Well. We don't actually have a target as such, but what the government has said is that um, there's a potential of 3 to 4% electricity uh, by 2030. Mm -hmm. So even the kind of non-target is not particularly ambitious. Now, 4% is um, an unextraordinary target, would you say? It's, it's pretty unambitious. I mean, um, I mean, what we've done today is actually try to put together an estimate of what we think the, 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 the kind of resources out there in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and uh, we've set a target that's really quite a modest part of that resource for 2030. Okay, well we have a, a chart uh, that we want to show, show you, uh, showing a percentage of 2014 electricity usage. Uh, do we have that up on the screen? And we were here. So why don't you walk us through the chart? Yeah, sure. Sean. So what, what this chart is doing is it's very reproduced from the, the paper uh, that we, we put out today. Uh, what this is doing is the first row is, is talking about the resource. So really looking at how much, um, if there's no other constraint, how much could we generate here in Hong Kong. So for solar, which is really examining how much space, open reservoir space there is and how much uh, roofs of houses there are, using some most up-to-date research we could, we could find. So resource is the potential of generation? Of, gener of total uh, demand in 2014. 22% is pretty, uh, That's pretty impressive. Hard. And offshore wind, we've got something like 400 square kilometers of, of um, sea that's kind of not part of um, sea traffic lanes or all these other kind of impediments. And um, those 400 square kilometers could generate something like 26%. And the energy from waste, which the government already has some plans to exploit, that's another 3%. <coughs> no, we're not suggesting that 50% is anywhere like a realistic um, objective. When we're scaling back from that, we think 10% is a realistic objective. 10% by? By 2030. Right. And uh, you know, of the kind of 22%, something like 15% uh, of that uh, could be met, we think, quite reasonably in, in 10 years' time. Uh, so 3.5%, similar amount of wind. Oh. <coughs> the government actually already set out ideas for two particular wind farms. So we're going sort of maybe two, two and a half times more than that. So really, we're talking about solar, offshore wind, uh, energy from waste, yeah. as the chart indicates. Um, there's also potential for 
Tidal, tidal energy. energy. Yes, yes. And in fact, this and is that's a, completely new technology. This right? is what's missing from this chart, by the way, <coughs> uh, is tidal energy, where uh, Hong Kong is surrounded on three sides by the ocean. So wherever there is the ocean, you will have the tide. Now, tidal energy can take in two forms. You can have the looking at the tidal height or the tidal current, and both can be explored here in Hong Kong. Uh, but it's it's, uh, it, it's 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 not been talked about very much because uh, nobody th thought this would be a resource that could be tapped. Uh, but I think it is possible that if you given enough research, that there is a huge potential that you can tap the tidal energy potential. Now, a little bit further ahead, there are also uh, people doing a lot of research on wave energy. Uh, which we have not very high waves, but there is still potential that you can tap into to harness wave energy, uh, convert them into electricity. Now, uh, in, in terms of, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stay with the sea, um, wind generation, um, there isn't much in Hong Kong. Why is that? Well, Hong Kong has got reasonably good wind characteristics, uh, not as good as some of the uh, more temperate climates. So up in the north, so you get more consistent and steadier winds. But there has been quite a lot of characterization work of wind you know, done by universities in Hong Kong and also by commercial companies, generally working either for um, Hong Kong Electric. So Hong Kong Electric funded quite a bit of work almost 10 years ago. And they sort of set out how much the wind speed was in different regions. Basically, once you get speeds of around four to six meters per second, that's enough for generation. And there's, there's you know, quite, quite large parts of Hong Kong waters that are good enough. Does, do Hong Kong waters present special challenges to develop wind farms? Yeah, um, you know, when you, when you talk about traditional wind farms, you have to anchor the mass all the way into the, the, the ocean's bottom. But the, there's this mud covering the ocean bottom here in Hong Kong. So when you want to anchor these mass, then obviously the cost will be a lot higher. The engineering design has to be more sophisticated. And so that all adds to the cost. Uh, but there are technologies now that you can think about, which is uh, floating wind farms. Mm. So it's been tested, and it's possible <coughs> that you can actually have floating wind farms uh, to harness the wind. Um, that's that's nascent technology, right? Oh yeah. Well, it's being tested. I don't I don't know if there's any operational floating wind uh, wind farms yet. Yeah. Um, now, I think solar. <laughs> has the most potential uh, in Hong Kong immediately, right? Wouldn't yeah. you say? Uh, uh, there's the potential for, if we get our uh, tariff, uh, et cetera, for rooftop generation, solar. Um, where else? Uh, you know the old uh, saw here in Hong Kong, we don't have much land. If we do uh, sort of solar on an industrial scale, you might say, um, where do we put the panels? I think the most exciting opportunity for solar is probably um, on the reservoirs. So already here in Hong Kong, um, there's uh, a small um, sort of experimental facility at Shen Pek. Uh, but altogether in Hong Kong, we've got something like 24 square kilometers of reservoir. So it's really quite a lot of space. And I think what we, we did in our analysis was look at, you know, looking at how much um, they might capture. And if we chose to, I don't think it's a good idea to, but if we chose to cover the whole thing with uh, solar, you get something like 10% of our electricity just from the reservoirs alone. And as you know, um, buildings are another opportunity. And, you know, Johnny and I were talking on the way here. There are other, other locations on, on roads, on, on car parks. So a lot of um, open space out there. But it's a matter of really having the policy in place. I'm, I'm very happy now that the government has uh, announced that the feeding tariff will be coming in next year. Yeah, I think, my, uh, yeah, yeah, that was so my next question. <laughs> So, I mean, suddenly the, the economics will change now with the feed-in tariff. And we, we just need to make sure that the feed-in tariff is enough. And that's the big kind of question mark. You know, solar, it's not been explored enough now. Everybody says, ah, we have tall buildings, therefore you get in the shade, so therefore you can't get the, the sunlight. But there are a lot of open places, like, for example... Well, lots of rooftops on buildings too, right? Well, lots of rooftops, lots of bus stops, lots of sun barriers. Uh, all these places are exposed to to the air all the time so you can you can you can take advantage of these tops that you can put solar panels on and so people just need to explore that's one thing the other thing is that um, the building integrated PV what we call BIPVs it's it's never been 
installed in any of the buildings in Hong Kong. Of course, what are those? Well, what it is is that you put a <coughs> instead of a glass panel. It's th this glass is actually solar panels. Oh, you mean the windows? Yeah. So so and so you can actually let the light in, but at the same time generate electricity. Now, of course, to do that, the cost will be higher mm. for the building. Yeah. So, who's going to do it? Uh, you either will have to have a, a policy, law, or incentives uh, for people to buy into this technology. It's, it's, it's there. BIPVs are here. It's just that whether you want to implement it in new buildings. So, so there are opportunities. Now, uh, we acknowledge Hong Kong is behind uh, other places in developing renewals. Um, I want some feedback from you both on why you think uh, why you think we're behind. I think th the main thing is that Hong Kong has always believed, or, let, or maybe let itself believe, that um, renewables are expensive and difficult, and it's for somebody else to do. And I think what we're finding uh, around the world is, um, as other countries are experimenting with it and trying it and trying out policies, prices have really come down. So things that we thought just a few years ago that offshore wind is too expensive and solar PV is, 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 is unprofitable unless without high level subsidy. Mm. What we're fast discovering is no longer true. Um, most countries, there's an initial subsidy for the first few years as the, as the industry gets going, but it's not necessary afterwards. And I've been really excited in, in, the, in the few years I've been in Hong Kong how much offshore wind, which used to be a you know, horrendously expensive uh, technology in, the, in Europe, has you know, literally dropped by 60% in price nowadays. Uh, not new technology, it's just we're getting better at exploiting existing technology. I think it's the combination of um, policy and whether uh, corporations, industries in Hong Kong have the vision of turning something, uh, uh, some technologies into uh, application here in Hong Kong. Now, the thing is, for, for policy, if you set a target, um, I give an example, in Korea they give an, a, a, a target of 14% electricity coming from renewables. So all the power companies are developing technologies to meet that target. So if you t set a target, you can do this. Now number two is that some of the technologies that you can apply in here, in Hong Kong for example, can be a demonstration for use in all the Asian countries, Asian cities, where they have very similar type of tall buildings, uh, cluster buildings, um, and, and so on. So, so if you can develop these types of technology, you can actually um, ship these technologies abroad. So people have to look ahead and say, oh, we can't do this in Hong Kong because it's too expensive. But it's not because you can use this as a platform to sell your technology. Uh, uh, there needs to be more funding for R&D, you think? Of course. <coughs> I mean, the funding for R&D is just uh, too little here in Hong Kong, and I don't know if you know about this, that currently Hong Kong in universities, for example, the amount of funding for R&D is 0.7% of GDP. If you compare that with Korea and Taiwan and Singapore, and it's over 3%. So, so the amount of money that you can use for developing any type of research, it's just too small. Um, so I give you an example about tidal energy, right? So it's, a, it's an emerging technology. It has, needs a lot of uh, investment into the development of these technologies. But it's very difficult to get funding. We couldn't get any funding to do a test. And we, we, were, we were glad that we were able to do a small prototype through the funding from one of the um, real estate companies. Um, oh, go, go ahead. I have a very similar story. I mean, um, I think from your university as well, where um, a very kind of innovative uh, type of way of actually taking food waste and um, you know, converting that food waste into energy, but also fish food and also um, things to improve the soil was uh, developed along with the Productivity Council. It was a great idea. Um, again, there's a small, talk, very, very small pilot uh, plant. But really, it needs to go the next stage up, and yeah. you know, that takes a little bit more money. Really. Mm. And we need to sort of just acknowledge that an early stage technology needs, you know, to have a regulatory framework and a, and a funding framework that kind of help it. Um, <coughs> to what extent do you both think uh, 
the two local power providers are facilitating the development of renewals? I think we've both had opportunities to speak to our counterparts in the power companies, and you know, it's no secret to, that you know, they're essentially here in Hong Kong at least very well rewarded by the scheme of control as it stands there. Mm. And it's very much a focused around uh, the fossil fuels. So the way the scheme of control is ever always designed was really to, to build pl fossil fuel plants and keep the cost as manageable as possible and then reward them on that new build. Um, it's, it's a completely different challenge when you've got uh, technologies like solar where essentially they're not going to be running it, it's going to be individual houses, individual buildings. So we need to make sure that um, they, they create the space for more decentralized forms of energy to, to come to flourish. I, I think um, they are doing a little bit, but they could do more. So I mean, if the agreement to have feed-in tariff would be a good step. Uh, and uh, But they could actually try to think about um, adaptation of both established technology and doing some support, some research on development of emerging technologies, um, which they really have not done very much in the past. And some of these renewable technologies are kind of utility scale. So some of the large uh, reservoir-based uh, um, solar PV and some of the offshore wind. So if they chose to, they could actually export those technologies themselves. OK, well, thank you very much to you both for joining us today. And, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have a question that you think of later, you can uh, send it to us in our comment section below. Thank you very much. Bye.